Well, praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Great time of praise and worship as always. Helps us get into the to the presence of our Lord and our Savior. Now it's time for the Word. I hope that everybody has their Bible. We're going to pretty much stay in Romans chapter 8. I will be mentioning two or three other verses in the message, but, uh, but we're going to pretty much stay at the very first part of, of Romans chapter 8 today. So, if you would, let us go to Romans chapter 8, and let's just read the first, first part of Romans chapter 8. It's a long chapter, uh, but it's very worthy to, to, uh, to look at chapter 8, and, uh, and I'm sure that we won't finish even the first half of the chapter. We'll probably have a continuing to the next part toward the end. We've got to cover the end of chapter 8 because it's such a glorious text for us as Christians and, and, uh, and we need to know it. But if my people, if you're able to stand as we just open up with the Holy Scriptures, we're going to read probably the first 11 verses. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death. And that could be fleshly minded. There's another word there that could be used. For to be fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind or the fleshly mind or human mind is enmity, it's hostile to the law of God. Or against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be it, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or bring alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. Heavenly Father, so much, so much information what a marvelous text, what a marvelous chapter for us, oh God, as Christians, to, that we can rejoice in what you're trying to tell us. Holy Spirit, come even now, come. Minister as only you can supernaturally. I can't do it, Lord. You must minister supernaturally to those that hear this message. Lord, let our hearts be touched, even our flesh be touched. Let our minds, our carnal minds, be transformed even more. Let us be washed by your word. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, even now in advance for what you're going to do as we listen to what you have to share with us. And we give you the praise. We lift up Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King, our Savior, our Redeemer. Oh, the only one that gives us hope. We lift him up in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. 
The Apostle Paul began in chapter 3, and I, I know that probably the majority today that hear this, maybe you hopefully have heard two or three or four of the previous messages, but he started, he started ministering and answering questions and teaching us, really. He was talking to the Jew, but it's the theology for all of us. He, he began in chapter 3. He talks about the law and that is still active, even though we don't trust in the law to, for our salvation. He talks about faith of Abraham, and what did he find? He found that it's by faith that you receive righteousness. He, he talks about the flesh. Finally, after talking quite a bit about the law because of the Jewish mindset on the law, and he was speaking, uh, first of all, to them primarily, that they might uh, get the new covenant, you might say. But then in chapter 7, I did two messages on it. It starts off with the law, but then the Apostle Paul leads to our flesh, and that's what I preached on last week. And so he's really leading up to I guess is the best way to say it, through really the, the entire book of Romans, starting in chapter 3, he's actually leading up to teaching us and showing us one of the most marvelous things in the world. And this is what he, he's telling us in chapter 8, how marvelous uh, it is, the dispensation we have now, compared to what we did have. And so he talks about the flesh right before he comes to this that we're talking about today. What did he say about the flesh? He didn't say anything good about the flesh. In fact, he talked about how he found the things that he wanted to do he couldn't do. It's, a, it's an interesting text, and I, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Oh, what I hate, I do. What I don't want to do, I do. What I do want to do, I can't do. And I find all these different things going on in my, my body that, that, uh, that, that seems to go against me. And he's, he actually comes to the point of saying there's a law there. We're going to talk about... We'll talk about the law there that, uh, in a few minutes when we come to verse 2 of, the, of our text today. But he ends up saying, basically, he saw nothing good in the flesh. And, uh, and then he ends up with this powerful statement. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that's what he pretty much ends the chapter with. He recognized, and I, I truly believe that, that he experienced such a closeness to God. It made me think of Isaiah um, chapter 6, where Isaiah is in the presence of God. And uh, in the presence of God, he, he, the scripture says, he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of, basically a sinner, I'm unclean, and in the midst of, of people with unclean. And woe is me in the presence of God. And I, I basically feel that's the way with Apostle Paul. He walked in such a presence of God that he just, he just sensed how evil, in the presence of God, how evil his flesh was with conviction, how wretched we are without Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he, he finishes there, and then he brings us to this marvelous word. I, I titled this, What Marvelous Words? Listen to these words. Chapter 1, or chapter 8, verse 1. Listen to this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And let's just stop it right there. Those are marvelous words. He's just shared how wicked as flesh is and how he senses how there's nothing in our flesh that can please God. It's not even subject to the laws of God, the new covenant laws of God. Even the old covenant, it, it couldn't save him because they couldn't keep the law. And he, and he sees his wretchedness just like I believe Isaiah saw it in chapter 6, woe is me. And he comes back and he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Church, these are marvelous words. As I was preparing this and I got a sense of this, I, I just felt the, the, how marvelous these words are. And, and the, these are words that really you and I, we understand in our head here. We understand it in our minds. We, we have knowledge of it. He, uh, like a lot of scriptural, scriptures and, and spiritual things, 
we have knowledge of it. We, we, we say, well, I understand. I know these are marvelous words, but I don't think we can truly, truly grasp how marvelous these words are. There is therefore now. And so let us look at, uh, first of all, let us recognize, and I hope you pro already were aware of this, but when you see a word like therefore, therefore what? The first thing you have to recognize when you see the word therefore is you must look at what was already said. Something's been said, therefore. And so we must look at that. And there's other words like that. When you see it in Scripture, you need to, to stop for a moment and say, well, what's been said that's causing him to say what the Bible's saying at that moment? Whereas, wherefore, even though, henceforth. These are all type of words that you can say, wait a minute, henceforth means he's talking about what he just spoke about. And, and you know, this helps us if we grasp that because sometimes we can take a text and we can get it out of focus and miss it really what, what the, the writer and the Holy Spirit's trying to, to show us. In this place, he says, therefore, I want to put, a, I want to put another word in there, the that would fit well with this. In fact, I, I really like it. How about even though? Even though my flesh is so evil, even though my flesh cannot please God, even though I, I, I just can't do all the things I want to do and wish I could because of the law of the, the flesh, and, and just because I... Hey, you know, even though I hate the things I, I do and wish I could do the things I can't do, even though, and that's what he's trying to get across, I believe, in this first verse, even though my flesh is so wretched man that I am, even though, therefore, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. He's, he's separating here the two, basically, after the flesh are those that have not believed, those that are not in Christ, those that are not born again, is, is what he's focusing on here. He wants us to understand that you're no longer in the flesh after you receive the Spirit of God. And we come back to that same issue that we've talked about in the last couple sermons, because this is the point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make. We're all sinners we're born into sin through the nature of Adam, and we're all sinners in need to be saved. You must be born again, and if you're not born again, then you are considered, according to the Scriptures, the way that Paul words it, you are in the flesh. Basically, you're one with the flesh before salvation. You are so one with the flesh that it has dominion over you, the law has dominion over you, the sin nature of the flesh has dominion, the Scripture says, the Apostle Paul points out. And so therefore, on Judgment Day, if you're one with the flesh because you're in the flesh, then on Judgment Day, you're going to stand in condemnation because you've been living your whole life walking, as he said in this verse, after the flesh. And so you're one with the flesh, you're under the flesh, you're not a believer, then you will be condemned and you will be subject to total separation, eternal separation, hell, You'll be subject to that at judgment time if you're still in the flesh and are not born again. We must understand that point. So then you get saved. You receive a new spirit, and God separates you now from that power. Now you're in Christ. You're not considered by God in flesh. You're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you're not going to be subject to the condemnation of those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And if you're in the Spirit, he's trying to give you some marvelous words here. Listen to these words, because these are marvelous words. Think about what he said. Even though I'm wretched, even though I can't do the good things I want to do, even though I do things I don't want to do, even though, therefore, he's saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus I don't know if I can express it well enough. It's a supernatural thing, but 
But there's times when you're, you may get on a spiritual high, and I hope you've been there where you, you just feel and sense God so real that, that it's so exciting. Your spirit just sails, like um, we sang this morning, like on the wings of eagles. And so there's times when you get a sense of the marvelous words we have here. I don't think we can get it without the supernatural. I don't think we can have that joy and recognize how marvelous this word is. I almost called it, what wonderful words, because I thought of Isaiah 9, 6, where Isaiah said the Messiah that was going to come, he's going to be, the, he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so I almost called it, it, it that would be good, but I just like that word marvelous. I think marvelous is a, a, a great word, so, but it could be the wonderful words. Can we, even, can we even grasp it? Can we grasp the word? Think of these marvelous words. Can we, can we grasp the word saved? We can define it. We can express what happened in our life, but, but, but these are marvelous words. How about redeemed? How about washed in the blood of Jesus? How about the marvelous words that if we walk in the light, in 1 John 1, 7, he said, we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Can we even grasp the marvel, the marvel of those words, the wonder of them? And then two verses later in 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sin that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those are marvelous words. I, you know, they're holy words. They're righteous words. What about the word righteous? When he says he took our unrighteousness and gave us righteousness, he took our sin and became unrighteous that we might become righteous. Do you understand and grasp the marvel of those words? I mean, those are glorious words. God took your sin... And he gave you righteousness. Can we even grasp that? Without a supernatural touch from God, without, even as I'm talking to you right now, without God opening that up to our spirits, we, I don't think we can even grasp it. I really don't. It's far beyond our, our human minds to really, it's, it's up here. It's in the supernatural realm. How marvelous. How about, how about the Beatitudes? How marvelous are these words? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those are marvelous words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. He's talking about us. If we are merciful, if we see what, 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 what happened to our Lord and Jesus on that cross, and we see that, and we have mercy for him, and, and we receive that work that Jesus did on the cross, if we have mercy on the work of the cross, of Jesus, what he went through for us, then we will receive mercy. I believe that's the, the, the foundation of that verse, blessed are the merciful. And then we, we play out that by being merciful. We play out that by being merciful in our lives and, and God showing his mercy in, in our days here and our walk here in, on earth. Those are wonderful, marvelous words. They really are. Praise the Lord. And so... I look at this and I think, how glorious. There is therefore now. Think about it. He's talking about now. We leave that word out now sometimes. Even in the definition of faith, we'll say it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is the definition, but most people miss the first word in that sentence in, in Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now. Where's your faith now? Where are you now? Are you born again, washed in the blood? Are you walking after the flesh? Which at that point, and he, he mentions that later, trying to talk about walking in the flesh or after the flesh is really death. Are you walking after the flesh, which is death? Or are you walking after the spirit, which is life and peace? As he said here, Church, these are words beyond our comprehension. These are supernatural words. There is therefore now no condemnation, even though 
your flesh is wretched, even though you don't do all the things you know you should do, all that stuff I've already said, even though these are marvelous, wonderful words. And so he is wonderful, isn't he? He should be called wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's go to verse 2. In verse 2 he says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the Spirit of life. Now here we have a term, term that you don't see anywhere else in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, gave him these words to write to us. The law of the Spirit of life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is the law of Jesus. What is a law? And so often we think of the law like a government law. We break the law. We, we could be put in jail or fined if we're a speeding ticket. We think of laws like that. But we're talking about biblical laws, truths of the Bible. What are the laws? Let me just read the laws mentioned in the book of Romans. There's eight of them. Listen to these. There's the law of Moses, the law of nature, which is our human nature, the law of faith, the law of the mind, the law of sin and death, the law of righteousness, the law of God, and lastly, the one we have here, the law of the spirit of life. What is a law? Scripturally, the Apostle Paul is not talking about the Ten Commandments written on stone because he tells us and makes it very clear, and the Scriptures do, even from the Old Testament, that God, one day during the New Covenant, He would write these laws on our hearts. So they're there. They're still alive in us. And when we break them, the, our heart, our conscience speaks to us. And the Holy Spirit uses that to speak to us. But what is a law? And I was thinking about the other day, I... I I heard it on the news, and you may have heard this too. It wasn't, I say the other day, time flies. It might have been a month or, or so ago. But there was a lady in, at the Grand Canyon, and she was standing too close to the edge. And the law of gravity took over. And, of course, did. And they talked about in the article, I, I finally went and got on the web and looked at an article, and they talked about how many people die every year accidentally falling. I know when I see people standing on the edge at the Grand Canyon in pictures, I, I, I almost tremble. I, I, man, I couldn't do that. I couldn't stand there. I, I take a chance like that. That's just not in me. But she fell to the law of gravity. It's just there. The laws of God and the laws of righteousness, and what were those laws? The laws of righteousness, the laws of the mind, the law of faith, the law of nature, the law of God, the law of the spirit of life that we have here. It's, it's just there. God has put it in place. What is righteousness? God has given us a standard of what righteousness is, and he expects us to live in that. A law is, is just, in the Bible, it's all the promises, all the things that, that God has said that we can say, Amen. <laughs> the Bible says it, Amen, you know. Marvelous words, and some of them are, aren't necessarily on the positive side, but, uh, but the majority of them are promises. Good stuff. Marvelous words that promise us that, that if we walk this life, we'll, we'll receive good stuff. You know, the, the law of giving. And receiving. It's more blessed to give than receive, the Apostle Paul said. The law of sowing and reaping, which would go along with that. These are general laws, but the two great laws that he gave us, the Apostle, or not the Apostle, but the brother James, and James refers to the second one as a royal commandment. That's one of the laws of God. The two great commandments that God's given us to live in today, and that's what we're to do is to live in these laws of God. The law of the Spirit is to love thy Lord with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And the second, which is the one that James called the royal commandment, so that makes the first one I think of it as a royal commandment as well. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the law of the Spirit. And then we have some that I've named, you know, some other basic, smaller, lesser, you might say. He says, if you'll fulfill the royal laws, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, then you personally 
as Jesus fulfilled the law, you will fulfill the law. And did you notice, as I read the text, he speaks about us in verse 4. He says that the righteousness of the law, verse 4, might be fulfilled in us. Do you see that? That's, that's God's purpose. We get saved in His general purpose for me and for you. Oh, there's a lot of commands. You know, we're to be ambassadors for Christ and go share Jesus and, and live a, a, the life that shows it. But, but we're to fulfill righteousness and destroy the works of the devil through our lives. As Jesus fulfilled, He went to the cross and fulfilled it all. That we might just live by the law of the Spirit of life. Look at that one more time, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We can only fulfill it, of course, by being in Christ. And that's what he speaks of. He, he really speaks of the other side of the coin, you might say, in verse 3. Let's read verse 3. He says, For what the law... Now, now he's talking about the Mosaic Law, and you can think of Ten Commandments if you want, but really all the righteousness of God really would be encompassed in this word law, the standard of God, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. For what the law could not do in that it was weak. And so he's going to mention and even give us some of that process and some of the other verses that we read. But basically he's saying that, that we cannot fulfill this law. Our works won't do it. Your flesh can't do it. If you could be saved and if you could fulfill the righteousness of God... Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. He tells us that in Galatians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul speaks of that. He says, if, if, Christ, if righteousness comes by the law, he said in Galatians 2, I think it was verse 21, he says, then Christ died in vain. Christ didn't need to die on the cross, such a horrible thing that he went through. If we could save ourselves, you cannot be good enough, you cannot pay enough money, you can't keep the Ten Commandments, you can say, well, I'm a good person, that's fine, but you still break the law because it's in our human nature. And that's what he's getting across. The human nature is weak. It has a propensity and an inclination. And the sin nature we've been set free from, he says in verse 2, you and I have been cut away, and he uses the flesh. Jesus' flesh was like a circumcision. He says, and, and, he, and he says, we were circumcised by the flesh. Jesus Christ was torn for me and you. That we might be circumcised from this law of sin and death. We've been cut away in the heart. And I know we can't cry, quite understand that. You might try to picture it a little bit, but, but, but he compares it really as a circumcision. We've been circumcised spiritually. And he, he gives us that example. And it was through the flesh of Jesus Christ that suffered for us. That we were cut away when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We were set free from this law of sin and death, which is the human nature. And so now we're in Christ, not in the flesh and bound to it. It doesn't have dominion over us. The law doesn't have dominion over us. We have a power in us greater than he that's in the world and in this old flesh and it's our job as Christians to live that out. It's our job as Christians. God expects, by the way, He expects fruit. And you can go through the parables and many of them speak in a, in a manner that, that tells you that God expects fruit from what He's done. He's planted you as a Christian and He expects you to bring forth fruit. And that's the fruit in, of righteousness, the fruit of holiness. It's, it's the fruit that, that says, I'm a Christian. It's the fruit in your life, the way of life and the way you live. It says, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm living for Him. Oh, church, even what I'm sharing with you today, these are all marvelous words. What He's doing now is He's going back to what He just said in 7, and He's saying, look, even though a wretched man that I am, even though, He says, therefore, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, that walk not after the flesh, 
but after the Spirit. Now there's questions, I guess, that could come up. What if you walk after the flesh? Well, then you need to examine yourself because he's really making a factual statement as well as proclaiming the difference of someone that's saved and someone that's not saved. The factual thing is the man that's after the Spirit will follow the things of the Spirit. Do you remember he said that? Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. So if a person's lost, of course, what would they follow but the human nature? which inclined and to sin and has no power really in themselves, really and truly, to overcome that nature. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of flesh. Listen to this. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So it's really a fact. If you truly are born again and truly washed in the blood of Jesus and recognize that God expects you to fulfill righteousness, then you will be after, in other words, you will follow after, that would be another way to say it, the Holy Spirit will be what guides your life to where you're trying to fulfill the righteousness of God, you're trying to please God. And so it becomes a fact that if you truly are born again, if you truly are wanting to please God and walk with God and you are His and you've been, you've been set apart, you've been made free, as it said in verse 2, from the spirit of sin and death, then it's a fact that you will truly desire in your heart and try. We have all kinds of times we fall and we have to repent and rise back up again. But if you truly are God's and you truly want to please God, you will try to follow the leading of the Spirit because you're a spiritual creature now being led by God and you're in God and, and he's going to lead you if you're trying to please him. And so we have a fact, a truth. You can examine yourself. Are you walking after the flesh? Or are you walking after the spirit? Oh, church, let me just say it again as we close. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. These are marvelous. We can't even grasp salvation. These are marvelous words. And I pray that you've made Christ your Savior and your Lord, and that you're walking after the Spirit. Heavenly Father, we just praise you today. We thank you, Lord, for this word. Come, Holy Spirit. Minister to our hearts and speak to us today, Lord. There could be some watching me right now or listening to this message that need to examine their lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Speak to each one of us that we will examine our hearts. Are we in Christ? Are we trying to please God? Are we truly saved, born again? Or are we still in the flesh? Come, Holy Spirit, do that work that only you can do. But Lord, in the meantime, I just want to praise you, O oh God. What a marvelous, what a marvelous text. Oh God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Next week, we've, I don't see how we can at least have at least the one more message. We've got to get to the end of Romans chapter 8 where, where he climaxes this whole thing that he's trying to show us and the glory of it and, and there's no way we can really I say there's no way there's no way I feel like that I can go on and not at least take us to that end of the chapter whether we get detailed in the center we'll see but but we want to get to the end of the chapter where he talks about us having a victory in Christ Jesus amen so God bless and may the Lord bless you amen